Thank you for joining me. This is Dan, and you're listening to the Having Initiative podcast. This episode is entitled, What is Natural? Now, there's going to be some overlap or duplication of what I said from the episode full potential, but I, I, I took a look at the outline I made, and this is substantially different, so you'll get a good experience. So I mentioned earlier that with politics and society and all kinds of aspects of life, you got people arguing for some kind of change or improvement. And an argument that often comes up is that they know what is natural or kind of best for humans in a way. And so their policies line up to address issues that are in line with nature or with what is natural and therefore are more likely to succeed or to be beneficial. Now, I have my own experiences with studying science and psychology and just learning on my own. And the, the more and more I go, the harder and harder it is to kind of pin down what is natural with humans. It's not so easy to determine. Um, there's an evolutionary psychologist. I think he's an evolutionary psychologist, Brett Weinstein. And he was quoted as saying, humans have a superpower compared to other species and it's that we are very adaptable we can live almost anywhere on the planet and he said we're adaptable sometimes to our detriment and so that uh, idea right there about adaptability that makes it hard to ascertain what is truly quote unquote natural if it could be reduced down to something even a range and another argument that comes up is nature or nurture. We see people doing stuff, and sometimes there's more evidence than others, but people will attribute certain actions to nature, saying that it's kind of unavoidable, or if you want to change it, you have to really work hard at it. Or they'll say it's nurture, which is a, means that if we want a different result, we just provide a different stimulus socially, that kind of thing. And so other questions that come up along with those are, okay, is there a bad behavior and can it be, if it's natural, can we nurture it out because it's creating a less than desirable outcome? And if it's a, if we, there is an in behavior that's inherently good, that's natural, is it possible that the environment is what is suppressing it? And then don't even get me started about throwing technology into the mix because we are so very heavily dependent on it. But, uh, I mean, nature didn't produce an iPhone. It, it didn't, doesn't just happen. It wasn't growing in the Amazon and we plucked it. And uh, back to what I said about arguing with politics or society, a lot of people tend to advocate for a better world based off of what is quote-unquote natural. And they can be really selective about what we should give up or stop doing at times. Like a, a big argument with what is natural is that, okay, this, however you want to call it, our behaviors are the natural result of just kind of seemingly a fundamental aspect of our universe, how we're built, for instance. And so if you fighting against that either will cause us distress or or we won't be healthy because we're, you know, doing something unnatural. Or maybe they're saying that if we uh, drift away from what is natural, we will fail constantly because it's, it's like trying to do something that's physically impossible, that kind of thing, but with human behavior. So, uh, and a lot of people who argue for, you know, natural is best, they'll criticize how much we stare at our screens and how ugly concrete cities are. Uh, but they like to use cameras to document their nature excursions and share all of this on social media and are arguing if we, people aren't given access to basic amenities like plumbing and you know running water, then we're being inhumane to them. So a lot of the natural talk is there's a limit on how naturalist people are willing to go. So some, a lot of those ideas, that's what's going to be explored here in various domains. And some of those domains are psychology, diet, and politics. All right, and let's get to it. Okay, so what is natural with psychology? This is a tricky one. I've mentioned this earlier that 
with science, you know, we like to think of science as working with um, measurable quantities that can be empirically measured. Like we take these reactants, we weigh them and make sure that we have that amount and we take, add them together with another reactant and then we weigh the amount of the products and separate them in a mass spectrometer, that kind of thing. And we get a bunch of numbers and we interpret that. But human psychology, we can't see all the variables that are going on in your head, basically. So it's not a hard science and it can be tricky to make conclusions about them that like with um, physical laws, we can repeat them over and over and over all other variables being equal and say, this seems to be a fundamental aspect of the universe. We can't quite do that with human psychology. So determining what is natural is a little tricky. And as I mentioned back in mental health, looking back on uh, human basically diagnosis of things before there was even diagnosis of mental illnesses or whatnot, or just mental phenomena. And also just going off of self-report, we like a person, even if they feel safe, may not be entirely honest with themselves. So uh, did, uh, again, determining what's natural with psychology is very difficult. Now, one aspect of psychology is trauma and so many difficulties that adults face i've noticed are being lumped in as oh that's a result of trauma and i mentioned in mental health oftentimes a lot of issues that adults have stem from some childhood quote unquote trauma and i say quote unquote because some of the things may seem like small like um We've heard people with debilitating issues that had a horrible experience of being physically or emotionally or sexually abused. And it's like, okay, I can see how they would have issues as an adult. But I told another story about how someone was reluctant to speak up or share. And it all boiled down to one experience in grade school where they just kind of mean things were said about them in front of their classmates. And that was traumatic. So trauma, I do think the term is being abused, but it has its place. And it is a real thing. Don't get me wrong. I had to fix some issues from childhood into adulthood, and I'm a lot better since then. But an idea that's being passed around right now is that our natural state is free of trauma. Like the the verbiage that's being used is, okay, if as an adult you feel bad or you're not blissful, it must be something unnatural happened to you, okay? Any negative emotion is being wrapped up as society damaging you in some way, or maybe it was your parents or something like that. And th these ideas of childhood trauma get lumped into that notion that society constructed you in this way, and society is a unnatural byproduct of our technology or bad decisions we've made, and therefore if we... Um, change society, then everyone will be thriving. And I know that sounds like I'm exaggerating, but, and perhaps I am a little bit, but I do hear that argument a lot about how the natural state of humans is bliss and not being, not having any negative stuff besides momentary instances of anger or something like that. And so they're almost suggesting that they could create a society that, or there is such a notion of a society that won't traumatize anyone, quote unquote, because it works within what is natural. Now, um, I'm not an historian or an expert in culture by any means, but I've you know caught glimpses of people all over the world, whether in person or just reports and news and whatnot. And guess what? I don't know any culture that's doesn't have issues. I mean, some may be bigger than others or whatnot, but every human flaw that you see, like bullying, that's one because it's like, oh, our society has made bullies. Bullies are everywhere, you know? And like, oh, people are so mean on the internet. How did this come? People can be mean and rude all over the place. Like they have a few interactions with someone from a different country. It's like, oh, those people are so happy and loving. Trust me. They got issues and I'm not trying, I'm not here to bash everyone. I'm just saying everything that happens with humans can happen anywhere. And so, and we all acknowledge that humans aren't perfect. And it seems <laughs> people willingly acknowledge that 
humans aren't perfect, but at the same time, if humans are doing anything that's not perfect in a negative sense, like being rude or whatnot, a lot of times it's lumped in like, if someone's rude, then they must have been hurt some way, or they're afraid, and so they're lashing out. They're attributing all negative aspects of us to something bad that happened. And again, it's going back to that idea of, okay, the natural state is wonderful, and so if there's something negative, it must be because something was done. So I would argue that the natural state of humans is kind of misery and hardship and whatever comforts we have right now are a byproduct of our technology or quote unquote society. I mentioned in an episode in season one that I love to an extent those shows like Survivor and Naked and Afraid. And obviously, since we're watching the them on TV, we know that they are produced with a cameraman nearby. You know, people are, there's a brief period where people have little to no modern technology. I know that as Survivor goes on, they do challenges and they win stuff. And Naked and Afraid, they're allowed one modern tool with them. But there is a period of time where they are exposed a fair bit to the elements and aren't provided with food. And they, they, like, they do have a medical crew standing nearby in case things get really bad, but there's a certain amount that the filming staff will let people suffer in that state. That is the natural state of humans, not having access to all of our modern amenities. Mother Nature isn't the Garden of Eden. That's a, a kind of thing that I see. Like nature is warm and loving and benevolent. It's like, no, Mother Nature doesn't care about you. The movie The Revenant, like there's lots of examples of people being awful to each other, but nature is being awful to everyone too. <laughs> and it, that movie is an adaptation of a book that recounts one man, Mr. Glass's journey. And I saw that what happened to him in real life was actually much, 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 much worse. But the kinds of things you see in there about people being awful and having awful things done to them by nature. That stuff did happen at some point or another in time before and after that movie or the period of time that movie depicts in parts all over the world. Now, there's people that say we've lost touch with nature and our problems stem from that. Because like, an example being if people are having issues with sleep, it, like you don't look at a screen an hour before bedtime because that'll wake you up and it tricks you into thinking that there's light. If you want to get back to a natural sleep cycle, then go to sleep without any technology and do it with the sunrise and sunset kind of thing because you're naturally attuned to that. And so people are saying, okay, our issues, all of our anxieties or whatnot stem from that we've gotten away from nature. Now, if we go back to living, like, say, I think that was the 1800s, that when the Revenant went, took place, if we go back to living like that, you're going to trade the issues you have now for a whole nother set. And most people, even the ones who are, you know, nature lovers and arguing for how wonderful it is, they won't be prepared for that life. So the, my, once again, my point is that the natural state of human is to be, humans is to be battered by flora and fauna and the environment. And as I've mentioned that people blame our suffering on a deviation from nat nature and dependence on technology and our, how our culture adapted around that. There's also people that blame it on like Western society or capitalism and various other things. And a, a lot of those things I find to be painfully naive. Now, in some places, the West is held up as the pinnacle of progress, particularly because of uh, advances in science, that kind of thing, uh, progress and prosperity around the world. But anyone who lives here says, yeah, the West has a lot of issues. Now, in the Carl Jung's book, The Undiscovered Self, I think he wrote it in the 60s or late 50s. He talked about how there's a lot of disillusioned people in the West. You know, of course, there's problems. And he found them turning to Eastern philosophies that talk about peace and Zen and being free from anxiety, if you will. And he studied those cultures and found that they have just as many issues as the West does. So a lot of the people that were looking to the East for answers, it's another dead end in a way, if you will. So nobody has it all figured out. We're all messed up. So 
if nobody has this stuff figured out and we're all struggling all over the world with some kind of issue, like all of the natural ills, quote unquote, about like I mentioned with bullying or, you know, being awful, that kind of thing. Is it possible that that is the natural state of humanity? Now, we talk about everyone has some kind of trauma that they have to move past. So maybe trauma is natural if everyone's doing it. The specifics are just like personality quirks that individual people will have. Now, if that is true, I do believe we can live above it. I see people get over stuff all the time. But and whether or not trauma is natural, it's it seems like it's going to be here and it can overcoming it can be useful. So in nature, too, is that is that trauma natural? Let's talk about the brain a little bit for a second. Um, a lot of animals mature very fast. I think maybe it was I saw a thing about a giraffe or an antelope and it showed them being born. They get plopped out and um, they stand up within minutes. Sometimes I think maybe I saw one that immediately stood up after being birthed. And they do it because the nature person says they have to be ready to move quick because there are predators around and like mom and dad can't protect them if they're just laying on the ground. They have to move somehow so they don't get eaten. Now, that's within minutes of birth. Now, human brains, at least the frontal cortex or prefrontal cortex, my bad, uh, are developing into your mid-20s. And I think someone said our, the brain is so big and advanced, it has to develop outside of when we're gestating. Um, it, it's it, being born, you know, there's so much more development that has to take place years because that's how complicated and intricate it is. And people, there's a Carl Jung quote about honoring or embracing your inner child. And I think a lot of people are misquoting it and taking it out of context and using it as justification to do whatever childish impulses they feel. But that he said that that child was open to possibility and bliss in a way that adults tend not to be because we are, you know, we've been hardened with practicality. And uh, he said that we can lose sight of things if we lose that inner child. But the thing was, is that so people argue that that inner child is the natural state and all of our sent practical sensibilities as adults stem from suppressing that. And so we have to, you know, embrace that to be truly happy. But again, that child was an underdeveloped brain. It was still growing. It wasn't the final form of a human, the mature state of our species that walks around and has, you know, responsibilities and has to do stuff. So we don't get eaten. That's, kind of the final form. And so uh, the arguments I hear from the uh, the influencers on social media about how, you know, your inner child is what's above and your inner bliss is important above all else, that inner child is incomplete. So it, there may be importance to embracing it, but that's not the end all. And a lot of times I've seen that argument about the nurturing the inner child to be an excuse for a lack of responsibility to themselves or to others. So in still in the psychology realm, I've heard the term stoicism being passed around, not a, a just a, a modifier of the word stoic, like as like, you know, just basic behavior, but a kind of philosophy. And I've heard bits and pieces of it here. So before this episode, I looked up the kind of tenets of it. And the results I got said that the tenets of stoicism are courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom. Now, I don't personally subscribe to stoicism per se, but I do think those qualities, courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom are useful, and I do try and, you know, live up to them in my own life. And when I talked about mental health, about how we can face our issues and live above them and grow... Like those ideals, they can be a guide to whatever trauma or difficulties we have. And it is possible to face the hardship and brutality of nature and thrive. But again, with that call to, you know, the natural state of humans is bliss. So anything that makes you feel bad must be unnatural or uh, something like along those lines. The calls to avoid those difficult things because they're a part of trauma, that's not helping. 
And so I think that we do get strength from facing difficulties. And so courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom, are they natural? I don't know. But regardless, they are useful and important, and we should strive for them. And maybe there'll be some more evidence someday about what is best. But again, like I mentioned in mental health, find out the ideal or ideal state that you should want to do and make it a good one and then see are your actions getting you there. And um, I don't think pure bliss is what most people, even if they aren't, you know, mentally tough people, uh, admire the concept, but they feel that they can't live up to it. And so they'll settle for, well, I'm a sensitive person. And so bliss is what I should strive for. Just something to think about. Okay, so talking about what is natural, let's talk about diets or diet in general. Now, before I go any further, I am not an expert on dieting, nutrition, or any specific diet. I'm going to talk about several I don't want to say fads, but there are ideas about diets that are being floated around right now. I apologize if I get some of these ideas wrong. This is my cursory knowledge, and so just bear that in mind with a grain of salt. Okay, a diet that I've heard recently being floated around is the paleo diet. And I believe paleo is short for, or in reference to the paleolithic era. And my understanding is that humans genetically, as we are now, stemmed from that point in time. We developed into what we are now in the Paleolithic era, and we can document more or less where humans were living during that time. And therefore, we can extrapolate what food was available. And so if the uh, diet and time and place and location of where humans were around when we became what we are, then we must be able to determine that that's what we are attuned to be able to eat and whatnot, or we should be eating. What's the natural state? Okay. Now, again, humans, the superpower we have is that we're adaptable. If that's the case, and that's those are the only foods that we were eating during the Paleolithic era, then maybe we've encountered new foods that are better for us in a way that the ones that were available were not. And the the common argument for the paleo diet is that since those are the only foods available, that's what we're attuned to, eating other stuff, we weren't built to eat that kind of thing. So that those are the, the, the cursory example of paleolithic. Another diet is vegan. Now, right now, I'm going to talk, like, there's lots of arguments for veganism. The only ones I'm going to talk to you about right now are in terms of the how they relate to the natural state or assertions about that. And the assertion that I hear is that, okay, great apes are vegetarian, the gorillas being the prime example of that. They have those huge fangs, but they only, they don't eat meat. So the argument that I see is, okay, there are closest, uh, or maybe not them, but others like them are also vegetarians, and they're our closest evolutionary pattern, or evolutionary ancestor in a way. So we must be attuned to also be vegetarian. And a a counterpoint to that is that gorillas spend 70 to 80 percent of their time foraging for those vegetables that they eat. And to our knowledge about the earliest humans, they didn't spend all of their time like that. And again, we're adaptable. So if at one point in our, you know, existence, we only ate plants, obviously, you know, that could change in time. And an argument for that is the canine that we have in our teeth that's basically meant for shredding meat. But then again, gorillas have big teeth too, but I don't know if they're quite canines or another classification. So again, take that with a grain of salt. Another diet that I hear a lot about is the carnivore diet. Um, I've mentioned, no, I haven't mentioned, I've heard mention of cultures in Africa that are primarily hunters and they don't, uh, like people say, that argue against the carnivore diet, they, how can you eat that much meat all the time? Now, the thing is, is that they didn't eat meat every single day. They would get a kill and eat, and they would basically be fasting for the next few days as they hunted for their next meal. And so the meat, they argued, basically, when they were fasting and it was being digested, had 
other effects. And I think ketosis is an argument that is involved in that the fat and the protein in the meat had their body go into a state that made them able to persist on that. And again, if that was our natural state, we're adaptable. Maybe we found something better than just eating meat. And piggybacking off the carnivore diet and how they didn't eat every single day or they ate less meat and they would fast. Fasting is something that I'm hearing a lot about right now. And full disclosure, I do intermittent fasting, uh, I, or I try to. Uh, I pick an eight-hour block and I only eat during that. Um, and the argument for the natural state of humans being fasting is that earliest humans did not have three square meals a day like a lot of us seem to be attuned to right now. And so they're saying if we couldn't survive off of eating a lot less, we wouldn't have survived. So we're built to operate off of less. And I've heard you know, various, I say small studies, and I'll elaborate in a second, saying that there are documented benefits to fasting. Uh, I know my, I have a cousin who did a 62 hour fast and they got really hungry at first, like whenever they were just missing their standard meal. But after about 24 hours, it went away and they didn't notice that they were hungry at all. They were able to function just as fine as before. And they said that they did feel better for a while. So I mentioned small studies with fasting because uh, to my knowledge, I saw a documentary and the largest studies were done by Germany and the Soviet Union. Now, the German one, I, they, there were only so many documents because it was a long time ago, but the Soviet Union one, there was secrecy about it, and so they couldn't disclose all of their details. But they found that when in you know, the clinical environment, when they were specifically deprived of food, patients that had some big issues like cancer and injuries – they healed a lot better when they were fasting. And if they had kind of chronic issues, they seemed to evaporate. So those are kind of the arguments for how fasting is the natural state of humans. And we should do that to be in tune with it. So as I said, I am not an expert on diet in general or nutrition in general. And I am not an expert on any of these diets. I've heard some stuff and done a little research on fasting in particular. So my advice to you, have initiative, do your own research, and when you're doing research, acknowledge what we know and what we don't know, and check how do we know the source. When they're arguing for something, how do we know what they know? So something to bear in mind. Okay, now with politics, this is an interesting one because I, I briefly touched on this earlier, and... I'll elaborate right now, which is that so many people, not just with politics, but when they're arguing for shaping society or improving it, that kind of thing, so many people seem to, one bit of argumentation is as to like when they're selling their idea is they claim to know what the natural state of human is, humans is, and their policies factor that in and incorporate it in a way so that it is most likely to succeed or have a beneficial outcome. Now, when they say, for the most part, that they know what the natural state of humans humans is, it tends to be about the emotional state of humans and not so much the psychological. Now, these two do get blended in the cultural zeitgeist a lot, but in, in ways that they should not be. Well, there is a bit of overlap. And I've mentioned a couple of times I'm wary of people who are claiming to be empathetic because oftentimes they're just getting swelled up in someone else's emotions or their own feelings. And that in and of itself is not enough to understand people and definitely not enough to base a political policy around it. So with their claims to know, like, emotional have the emotional understanding of people and how to get them to thrive or whatnot they reduce it down to something that's very simple typically it's like human nature is and they can say it in like one sentence or humans need this the most one sentence but nothing's that simple i mean for better or worse humans are complicated and varied so 
they lay claim to know how to make an economic policy or how to reduce crime or how to help mental health based off of that simple reductionist analysis. And so all people want this or all people respond to this or humans are built to do this. Or if we create this stimulus, then people will react in this way. Those are the kinds of expressions that I've been hearing. And for better or worse, they're going to respond in different ways to hardship or challenges or better yet, leisure or safety. I, I've mentioned in one of these episodes that there's an argument that if we make people feel comfortable, they'll reach their full potential because they won't be bogged down by fear. Not everyone, most people won't. A lot of people, if they feel safe, they'll get complacent. And that doesn't encourage growth. So with a lot of these policies, they claim that, I mean, the policy that they're pushing forward that is, again, adapted to their supposed knowledge of human nature, they can go with it or they can go against human nature. Now, for those that go with it, they say our policies are in alignment with what human nature really is or what humans were built to do or how humans respond. So if we implement my policy, people will thrive. Now, again, varied responses, so there's going to be deviations. And oftentimes, it's not even deviations. It's just that they're completely wrong. But when they see a deviation from their perfect worldview, they just ignore it. Nope, it's not there. Pretend it's not there. Or even worse in some cases, they chalk up that deviation to their uh, idea of what human nature is. And so they say, that must be the result of not following my policy. There go, this is even more reason why we need to implement my policy. And they go even harder about it. When reality seems to reject their established worldview, oftentimes they don't care. And that's dangerous. Really dangerous. Now, others argue that, you know, we have ideals of what human society should be, or I guess, you know, happiness, that kind of thing. But they say that human nature isn't built to naturally fall in those areas, kind of like what I mentioned with stoicism. But so they say, we have to create laws that will guide people out of the natural behavior and into the more desired behavior. Now, uh, right off the to their credit, the people that argue this way, right off the bat, they do acknowledge that there will be a bit of a clash on some level because, again, we are going against nature. But they argue it is for the greater good and that we can do it because of our mental ability to choose things. But, again, if you don't under fully understand quote-unquote human nature, whether that's acknowledging all of its variabilities or if you truly have sound if you truly have found something that's universal then are you sure that what you're pushing people towards is better because there may be benefits but there's probably going to be costs as well and so there have been times when you know the question has i it's popped up to me is that okay if you could improve society or make this change or design something better what would you do and when i was younger i said well if everyone did this then everything would be great that kind of thing but as i get older um i've become much more aware of just the so many different ways that people will behave and respond that uh, on one level my single dimensional okay do this and everyone will be better that won't work because of the different responses but also on another level as difficult as it can be to have so much variety and diversity in responses. Variety and diversity in responses is kind of what makes life interesting. You know, it's like when you're playing a video game, uh, a good video game will have some kind of progression and people will debate on this, but a lot of video games, as you get better or you develop more skills or get a longer health bar, that kind of thing, eventually the game becomes so easy because your character or what the player has developed so much and that you can just walk through everything and it's not fun anymore. And that's kind of a a parallel I make to this is that if you could quote unquote, solve everything, things will get boring in a way, not just boring isn't the right word, but people won't 
thrive anymore because there's a certain level of conflict. And I do think that is an aspect of human nature that we respond to conflict and we thrive when we do so in a certain way. So that's my point on uh, politics and what is natural. Okay. And that pretty much wraps up this episode. I've got another one where we're still going to talk about what is natural. So look forward to that. And yeah, thank you guys for joining me and I hope to see you again soon. And now it's time for a little bit of housekeeping. Hey everybody. Thank you again for listening. So with this episode and the next one, I suppose I recorded it and edited it. And then a few months, a month or two went by and it was time to deploy it. And then a month or two went by and now here we are deploying it on YouTube. And in those gaps between editing and deployment, there were so many times where I heard people argue in my life or just listening to other people talk on podcasts or whatnot, where people made the argumentation of, well, we should do what is natural and my plan is in line with that. So very topical. And these two episodes, they aren't necessarily episodes that I try and sell the podcast with when I'm like, here, listen to this kind of thing. But I do think they're really important. And I've gotten some good feedback in my personal life about them. So if you have anything to say on the topic, please leave a comment in the comment section. And if you'd like to support the channel, please like, comment, subscribe, or share this video or any of the other ones with people you know. So thank you again, everybody. And I hope you listen to part two. Take care.